manager on the board um, in the middle of my second year. If I can be a resource in any way, please feel free to reach out to me. But I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, it's, if you have the Whova app, there's all this information's there. Um, but this is Sally, Dr. Sally Fryer Dietz. Dietz. Uh, she is an internationally recognized pediatric physical therapist, sensory in integration specialist, diplomat certified craniosacral therapist, lactation counselor, author, and child advocate. She has been a pediatric physical therapist for over 40 years, has her doctorate in pediatric physical therapy from UTMB in Galveston, Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from UCSF California, and Child Development from SDSU California, and is the author of When Kids Fly, Solutions for Children with Sensory Integration Challenges. As an out-of-the-box thinker, Dr. Fryer Dietz has played significant roles in many medical adva advancements throughout her career. Her most notable includes her innovative treatment plan involving conjoined Egyptian twins, Ahmed and Mohammed, and their successful separation surgery. She has been seen on Oprah, Dateline NBC, Discovery Health, and international news programs throughout the world. So please recognize Dr. Sally. So that's what just happens when you get old. You do all kinds of things along the way. But anyway, today I'm gonna to talk about um, integrative physical and occupational therapy primarily but really go into a little bit more detail about what, what those things are. Um, a lot of times we think of PT and OT you know, as their therapy or the kids are just playing or whatever, but I wanna really um, talk about some of the techniques that we use, uh, primarily sensory integration therapy and how that fits into therapy. And I'm also gonna go into a little bit about craniosacral therapy since that's something that uh, a lot of people don't know that much about, so I wanted to kind of bring that to the table. Anyway, this is a little picture of our clinic. We're here in uh, North Dallas around uh, uh, LBJ and uh, just south of LBJ on Hillcrest Road. And we have a big multidisciplinary group with about 20 therapists. They include physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists, we all work together, and our primary focus is working together in a collaborative way and bringing as many tools to the table to work with kids. And I'm gonna share with you why that's so important, and you know, obviously we all know that every child is very different, and they all have different and unique needs, and the more ways that you can use to get into the central nervous system, the better. So these are kind of a sampling of a lot of the little things that we do and, uh, and what it looks like. So it's not like you're, you're a vision of just a, a sterile room where we do therapy. I wanted to kind of bring into this talk a little bit more than I usually do about the brain and the central nervous system, um, how it works together, what the corpus callosum does, which you probably already know, but why integration and sensory integration in particular is key to uh, addressing you know, any kind of a developmental issue that has to do with any of the structures of the brain. I um, want to go into a little bit more detail about you know, who are PTs and OTs, you know, what do they do, where do they come from, uh, what, you know, what makes us, us tick as, as pediatric therapists. We're kind of a unique uh, breed of therapists because we really love children and we love what we do and we are you know for the most part committed to lifelong learning and uh, doing as many different things as we can to help kids and their families talked a little bit about sensory integration why that's so important and then just you know again some of those sensory uh, techniques or therapeutic techniques that we use to address uh, pediatrics and since it's a small group if you have any questions, feel free to you know, raise your hand along the way and, you know, and uh, we can make it more personal. Anyway, uh, the child's brain obviously is like a sponge. Actually, all of our brains, brains are like a sponge, but children in particular, they are soaking up so much information at such a rapid uh, rate, especially you know, in that first 
year to three years of life that we really want to take advantage of it. And, you know, we think a lot of times is the brain just being up here in our skull when in fact it really is our entire body. All this information goes in through every part of your body. It has to go up the spinal cord. It has to go to different areas of the brain. And how all that comes together and works is really uh, quite a miracle. Um, but anyway, it's how we make sense of our world, how we grow and develop, how we learn, and how we mature throughout our entire life. So we always are integrating information, whether we're a child or an adult. And you know, getting that information in to make sense of it um, comes from everywhere. So this is the very simplified, you know, diagram of your brain, obviously. You know, we've heard about the right brain and the left brain, and we like to, you know, think of it in these two different categories. But in reality, the brain is a lot more complicated than that. But for the most part, the left side of your brain is more your um, logical and analytical side. Um, it, you know, you have your language that's processed on the left, your rationality, your sense of time, uh, math and science, it's more linear and it's more accurate. But in fact, it can't just operate like that on its own, uh, just on the left. But we also have this right side of our brain that helps to make sense of everything that's going on on the left and how those things have to come together. So the right side of the brain has a lot to do with your feelings and emotions, your senses, your creativity, your imagination, uh, intuition, curiosity, images, you know, vivid um, thoughts, art, all that stuff is, you know, typically associated more with the right side of our brain. So you can see how you probably have known people who were more what we would call left brain, you know, where they're um, in professions where they see very linearly, they do a lot of numbers and science and uh, a lot of our engineers maybe have a heavier focus on the left side of the brain, whereas the right side we sort of associate with more of the creative artist kind of a person. Um, most of us, every, we need to kind of combine those sides to be a well-rounded person. And again, how do you get those sides to talk to each other? We're going to uh, explore that. So here's, I'm going to go through these things kind of fast because I don't want to bore you with a lot of anatomy and physiology, but just to kind of leave you with the impression of we, we do so many things, and it's not just it goes into the brain and comes out, but um, your frontal lobe, that's where you process all this good information, your executive functioning, your organizational skills, um, problem solving and emotion, all that stuff, your ba behavior control and your personality, a lot of that is processed in your frontal lobe. But also part of your frontal lobe, you've got your motor cortex, so how you're moving, and your sensory cortex, um, how you're perceiving uh, different sensory systems. But that's where it's processed. It actually comes through your parietal lobes to get to the frontal lobe to do that. Um, in your parietal lobes, you've got uh, your perception, you're making sense of the world, your arithmetic, your, your spelling. Uh, those kinds of things are processed through that area of the brain. Uh, your temporal lobes are responsible for your memory and your understanding and your language. And then your occipital lobe is where you have uh, your vision. And then, of course, there's your corpus callosum that integrates all of it. It's like the networking that brings all those things together. So here's our, uh, the function of the frontal lobe, um, kind of just the same thing we already uh, talked about. But your motor cortex, this is where you're learning your motor skills. So when we have a patient who uh, is delayed in motor development, we need to come up with ways to integrate all the different pieces of the brain that have to do with motor planning and, it, and using your body physically. And it's processed up here in this frontal lobe in your motor, motor cortex. So it's your uh, learning how to do new motor skills, your intention, your purposeful movements, um, knowing what you're going to do with your body. And then your sensory cortex, which is also in the frontal lobe, uh, has to do with your sense of movement, where you are in space, your, uh, your balance and your body perception. Even though your balance and coordination, a lot of it comes from the back of your skull uh, or in your occipital lobe, it's processed up here in your sensory cortex. So when we talk about uh, therapies, we're 
and what we're really trying to do, we're talking about sensory motor development, and we're really working these areas of the frontal lobe to come together. Um, here's your occipital lobe. Uh, it helps to allow for your visual processing um, and makes, makes sense of things. So you can have intentional movement, but if you can't connect it with your occipital lobe to see what it is you're trying to do, it gets lost. So you can have movement, but it doesn't have the, the meaning or the purpose behind it. So again, as I kind of run through these, think about all these different areas and functions that the brain has to do, and how are they all going to work together to accomplish those things? Um, here's our parietal lobes. We actually have two on both sides. Your brain you know, is split down the middle, pretty much by a membrane, and you've got two halves of your parietal lobes. Um, this is vital for your sensory perception and your integration. So those lobes have to talk to each other and they also have to send messages to the different areas of the brain to process what it is you're feeling, what you're hearing, what you're tasting, what you're seeing, how you localize touch, all that stuff. While it goes in through those parietal lobes initially, it has to go somewhere else to assign meaning to it. So that's, that, you know, it can't do it all by itself. You've got to, you know, communicate with all these different areas. So for your language and your attention, you have to communicate with the frontal lobe and your executive functioning. Uh, for your visual functions, you have to communicate with your occipital lobe in the back of the uh, skull to assess, you know, size and shape and orientation in, in a space. You know, like reading a map, you know, how do you make sense of a map if you don't have some sort of visual spatial awareness? And that's really from this communication between these different areas of your brain. Um, and then it's important for your proprioception, which is how you take in your sense of movement through your muscles and your joints. Uh, it helps to coordinate your arms and hands and eye motions, and that also communicates with the motor cortex to make sense of it. Then, of course, we can't leave out the cerebellum. It's a little part in the very back of your, uh, of your brain. And this is where, you know, a lot of times children are referred for therapy because it affects your motor coordination. Uh, so your motor learning, coordination, balance, uh, your precision and timing is all uh, central, you know, starts out in the cerebellum and then again has to make these relays to other parts of the brain uh, to make sense of it. Your temporal lobes are just underneath your, uh, your ears. And when we talk about cranial sacral therapy, and you know, even with all these other areas of the brain that we're talking about, but your um, temporal lobes, this is where you have a lot of your advanced hearing and visual perception. Um, with the cranial work, one of the techniques that we do is working actually with the ears, almost using the ears as little handles to get these temporal bones to move. Uh, and it can really make a big impact on your visual, visual processing and, um, and hearing as a result, as well as your balance and your coordination. So it's just kind of interesting how those things all work together. So here's our, you know, kind of wrapping it all up uh, on the anatomy side, your corpus callosum, and you see how central it is to your actual brain. You think about your brain is it's almost like um, the consistency of a bowl of jello. And within that, there's all these neural networks constantly firing and going in these super highways to different areas where it has to get processed. And the process of even normal growth and development is um, dependent on the sensory motor experiences you take into that central nervous system to wake up those pathways to make these connections. And your corpus callosum is really uh, the key um, structure in the brain that allows that to happen. So every one of these regions, they have very specific functions where information is taking place. And if you have any kind of um, an insult to any of those areas, it can get in the way of how you're able to express that function. Um, all of the areas have to work to communicate with each other and they have to be able to communicate with each other. So without the corpus callosum, you really couldn't do that. So all the therapies that we do focus on 
waking up all those areas of the brain so that they can work together. Uh, this is, you know, just kind of the different areas, just like your frontal lobe has different areas where there's the motor cortex and there's the sensory cortex. The corpus callosum um, also has different fibers that connect to different areas of, of the brain. And so you can have different issues that are affecting the corpus callosum and have, while well, you have such a wide range of symptoms that can occur as a result of it. Um, so you're, the mid part of the corpus callosum interconnects the premotor uh, and uh, motor regions of the motor cortex, and it's critical for your bilateral coordination. Your brain, if you, you know, have, 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 how many of you have ever taken anatomy or physiology class? <laughs> Do you remember how what happens on the left side of your brain motor-wise comes out on the right side? It's, you know, you cross over uh, at, at the base of the, of the brain. So bilateral coordination is a reflection of how both sides of the, of the brain are talking to each other. So all these different activities that we do to promote bilateral coordination help to facilitate that uh, connection between both sides of the brain. And that happens in the middle part of the corpus callosum. Uh, the posterior part communicates with your somatosensory information and uh, particularly your parietal lobes and your visual center at the occipital lobe. So you can see something, but in order to make sense of what you're seeing, you have to have that connection. Otherwise, you're seeing something, but it has no meaning to it. Um, so what is really, you know, what is seeing? What is vision if you can't assign some kind of, of meaning and then be able to respond to it? Fortunately, we have this incredible, uh, incredible potential of uh, what we call neuroplasticity. And that is, and we now know, even though we have these different areas of the brain that are marked, you know, you usually do this in the frontal lobe and you do this in the parietal lobe and this in other areas, we also know that if an area is damaged, other parts of the brain will, can take over for those areas to a certain extent. And again, everybody is different. But because of neuroplasticity, we have the ability to um, really engage the brain in a way to have it make much more sense and, and function better. So your physical and your occupational therapies are really geared towards making those connections and facilitating that neuroplasticity so that uh, you can grow and develop as optimally as possible. It's also why sensory integration is such a big deal. Uh, when I first started my uh, private practice here in Dallas in 1994, I had um, people ask me, well, what's this new therapy, sensory integration? And it wasn't new at all. It's been around since the 50s. Uh, and it was developed as a theory uh, from an occupational therapist, uh, Gene Ayers, who found that it was critical for learning and development. And so for kids with learning differences, we've always used sensory integration uh, techniques. So sensory integration isn't like a therapy all by itself. It's really um, a filter or, a, or a, an approach that we use in pediatrics to work with the whole uh, central nervous system of a child in growth and development. So here's, you know, pediatric physical and occupational therapists. They can be kind of a little confusing sometimes because people don't really know what the difference is between a PT or an OT, especially in pediatrics. And the reason that is is because we do a lot of the same things and we have a lot of the same goals and we work together. So what uh, makes the biggest difference is what your background is and how, what you bring to the table uh, in terms of working with kids individually. What we do all, uh, also share uh, together, we're all licensed medical therapy professionals. Uh, we all specialize in pediatrics. Uh, you don't want to take your child to a sports medicine physical therapist, you know, unless they might have had a knee repair and you're trying to rehab that knee. Uh, that's a whole different specialty. So pediatric therapists are, are trained specifically to work with children. And we most often have a very heavy background in child development. Uh, a lot of our undergraduate work is in child development. 
um, or in psychology. Um, with physical therapists, we tend to be more, it's more of an anatomy and physiology background. Um, PT programs are a part of the medical schools. So we, you know, we're very heavily focused on the physical structure of the body, whereas OTs tend to have more of a background in um, counseling or, or psychology and education. But again, we all share this common goal of working with kids and, and bringing all those things together. Uh, one thing I know for sure is, at least in my clinic and the therapist that I have uh, the privilege of working with, every single person that, that we work with, they are really committed to lifelong learning. It's not that you get out of school and then you do the same thing for the rest of your life. <laughs> you are constantly, um, every one of your, of your patients is a teacher. You're constantly pushing the envelope to figure out, you know, what other things can we bring to help, you know, with kids and um, helping to bring out the best in what their nervous systems have to offer. And it makes it, you know, exciting and fun because it doesn't ever stay still. You know, we're constantly uh, coming up with new ways of working with, with kids. So here, I've, I've kind of really already said this, but you know, pediatric PTs, and you'll see too on the next slide with pediatric OTs, the one you know, thing we all work to improve physical function and ability in the body, and we all work with learning and development. Um, what sometimes is a little bit different if you wanna get really picky about you know, who do you see, a PT or OT, uh, kids who have more gross motor developmental uh, tonal issues, they're too high tone or too low tone or have problems with um, coordination and gait, typically they'll end up on a physical therapist schedule, uh, you know, to, for a physical therapist to work with them. With OTs, um, it's the same thing. We improve, you know, physical function and ability, learning and development, but if you had to pick it apart, if you have a child who has a lot of issues with self-care or social skills or a lot of emotional uh, lability um, and cognitive planning, they may end up more on an OT kind of side. In, in our practice, again, we're unique in that the PTs and OTs, while we have these different backgrounds, we all work together on the whole body. Um, a lot of hospital-based programs have OTs just working with the hands and PTs just working with the legs, which really doesn't make sense because you know you don't divide up a body like that. But that's how a lot of um, uh, programs are often structured, and that's how insurance companies like to look at PT and OT as well sometimes. So how we write our goals and what our um, functional goals are. We see it through our own eyes based on our experience and our background, but our primary goal is to get the, the whole body, the whole person, the whole child really working as optimally as possible and not just picking apart different pieces of it to, um, to make sense. So that's all the anatomy I'm gonna bore you with. <laughs> but uh, does anybody have any questions about any of those things? That fun stuff? So. Here's sensory integration. How many of you have heard of sensory integration? So not that many. So there's a lot who have not. So sensory integration is, um, like I mentioned before, it is a therapy approach. And it is practiced by both physical and occupational therapists. Um, in our clinic, we also have speech therapists who are trained in sensory integration as well. So we're able to um, filter everything through that sensory integration um, theory and practice. And as you know, we go on in the talk, you'll see a lot of the activities that we do, we work with children with their feet actually off the ground. And part of the reason we do that is we're really trying to engage some of these sensory systems a little bit differently so we can challenge the body more than they would be challenged uh, just at home or in a more traditional um, therapeutic approach like sports medicine or, or whatever, we're really working to integrate the brain because of all those different functions of the brain and our goals are to get it to work better together so that we have a whole functioning person 
uh, with everything working as well as possible. This is kind of a, you know, what happens when everything's working well. Think about your central nervous system, like the Champs-Élysées in France, where it's kind of organized chaos. There's all this information that's coming in from all over the place, and somehow, if the stars are lining up right, you know, in the traffic patterns, everybody knows where they're going. They go around this circle and they go out to the, their appropriate neighborhoods or whatever. Well, if that doesn't happen, if there's something that gets in the way, a car crashes in the middle or, you know, something, a car stalls or something else, then you get a pileup and you get chaos and disorganization. And a lot of times that's where we start to see children or see patients. It's in this um, disorganized state because all this information is going into the nervous system, but it's getting stuck somewhere. It's not getting to where it needs to go. It's not getting to the frontal lobe to be organized and figured out and put meaning to it, or it's not getting to your parietal lobes or your occipital lobes to know what your movement pattern should be, to have any kind of intention for how you're gonna get from point A to point B. So um, sensory integration has to happen for things to run smoothly. We use this a lot to describe, when we do an evaluation, we're really looking how we all grow and develop um, is actually really very organized. And it starts with your central nervous system. That's your, the basis for what you are, you come out of the womb with. Um, it's how your brain and your spinal cord and all your nerves are all working together. They're all there. So those are gonna affect your sensory motor systems or your sensory systems first. When we think about learning and development, there's three primary systems that we um, target, and that is your tactile system, your vestibular system, and your proprioceptive system. And I'm gonna talk more about those specifically uh, as we go on, but those are really your foundation for all these other higher level skills. Um, those are gonna affect your you know, other sensory systems, even how you smell, how you see, uh, how you hear, how you taste, all of that stuff, your, your tactile, your vestibular, and your, and your proprioceptive, and your central nervous system, how it all works together, is gonna influence how that information gets through. Those things are gonna affect your bilateral coordination. Uh, it's gonna affect your motor planning, how you learn new motor skills. So if you have a problem in your vestibular system, which is how you process movement, it will affect how you use both sides of your body together. So in order to improve your bilateral coordination, we need to go back to that vestibular system and think about what areas of the brain do we need to target and what kind of input do we want to put into the body or help to get into the body so that this child or this individual can make sense of it. So we're going through these sensory systems to get to these higher, higher skills. Uh, same thing with your ocular motor control. If you don't have good postural control, if you don't have good you know, vestibular and proprioceptive input going in, it's gonna make it difficult for your eyes to stabilize to be able to learn new motor skills and to bring your eyes and your motor movements together. So, you know, working with um, functional vision, we work with the whole body. We do functional vision training but we also do it in the context of sensory integration and sensory motor work so that we are working all those things together so that it's more functional. Uh, that's gonna affect your perceptual motor skills, which is typically what you think of in terms of, of skills that you learn in school, you know, putting things together, uh, your auditory language, um, your visual spatial perception, um, your attention centers, all that kind of stuff. So if you have glitches in that sensory motor core, it's gonna affect how you're able to perform in, in school. So rather than, um, well, for example, we'll have somebody who might call who says, my child can't write. You know, we want an OT to, to work on their writing. Well, it's never about the writing. If the writing is a higher, higher skill. It's not about having an OT sit down with somebody and teach them how to do letters and writing. It's really, okay, what is it that's influencing how they're able to write? Is it their visual spatial 
control? Is it their postural control? Is it their bilateral coordination, how they're using both sides of their body together? Is it how their eyes are visually tracking in combination with their hands? Um, so it's, it's figuring out what are the issues. These are the symptoms of what's happening, but the approach to how we treat it is very different. You know, we don't want to put a Band-Aid on things. We want to really work with the nervous system so that it works and so that you can optimize everything you've got going so that you have better skill performance. And when you go back to looking at the areas of the central nervous system that contribute to those things, that's where you target your therapies to get to those. This is a little bit different way of just looking at it, but again, starting with that central nervous system, that leads to your sensory motor development, which leads to your perceptual motor development, which eventually what we all want is for an individual to be able to learn, to be able to behave, to have joy in their life, um, to be able to regulate their attention, and their motor control, and to be able to communicate with others. But without all these other things, you know, playing their role, it's very hard to get to that. A lot of the children that we see are super smart. It's nothing about the intelligence, it's how they're able to express it, because they've got some of these things getting in the way. And uh, because they are so bright, most often, um, they come up with very creative ways of avoiding to do the things that make them feel uncomfortable. So you see, you know, you can have your class callouts, you can have your kids who just don't want to do anything, who have temper tantrums or, or whatever, but it gets in the way of them, you know, being able to do that. So we need to come up with, again, therapies that are going to relate to a child on their level that engage them, that they're vested in and having fun in. So motivation is a really key thing. Therapy should not be brutal. It shouldn't be something that you're forcing somebody to do. It should be fun and engaging, and that's, um, that's where things start to work. We also, besides the motor uh, aspects of, of therapy, we're always looking for how, where a child or an individual is, is showing up. Um, you can be overly responsive to sensory stimuli, or you can be under responsive to sensory stimuli. And it makes it very tricky for like teachers sometimes to figure out how they can best work with a child in their classroom because they just see the behavior. They don't see, well, what is it that's contributing to that behavior? Um, so our over responders, they tend to have a very high arousal threshold, um, which causes them to avoid sensory input. And if you look at this, it's kind of a confu confusing slide maybe, but you see that little tiny circle of just right there. That's about how much uh, in an overly responsive child that they're in that just right level to be able to learn and grow and develop in the classroom. Whereas in this typical, right in the middle, you've got this great big huge just right you know, area where most of the kids can sit and pay attention and learn and you know, yeah, they get overly or under you know, responsive and they tune out and they get tired and they get cranky and all that stuff, but most of their day, they can hold it together. But for our kids who have sensory challenges, their optimal window may be very small. So one of the things that we're constantly trying to do is enlarge that window so that they can take in more information and then can get more out of their environment. Uh, it's, it's never just what goes on in a therapy session. Therapy sessions kind of help to wake up the, you know, what, what lies within. You know, it's, it's um, we'll work with kids for a while and, and they'll, you know, we'll have parents who come back and say, I can't believe he went out and he tried this for the first time. I've been trying to get him to do that forever and he just did it on his own. You know, it's, it kind of helps to get the ball rolling so that we wake up that ability to get more out of just normal activities, you know, normal environmental uh, stimuli. Uh, same thing at the very top, you see this under responsive, those are your low arousal and sensory seekers. So if you have a sensory system that has a hard time um, registering sensory input, what these kids look like is 
they're out of control. They're all over the place. They're crashing into things. They're you know, licking the walls. They're seeking out spinning and you know, they just need more and more and more because it's not registering in their nervous system. So they go from zero to 100 in you know, seconds to minutes. You know, and, and they can look very much like these over-responsive kids. So how do, you, you know, how do you balance that out in a, in a classroom? So when we work with teachers uh, and with kids, because we have an idea of how um, kids, you know, their nervous systems are working, we're able to guide teachers a little bit more appropriately and parents on, you know, what to look for um, before they get to this point of having it be too much uh, and for their nervous system to be able to learn. This is, I think, a really important thing to remember, and every one of us seeks out sensory stimuli to make sense of it and gets in that just right stage, you know, so that we're able to pay attention. And um, it's very, you know, when you get up in the morning, let's, let me start over. Uh, when you get up in the morning, what do you do to wake up? Water on your face, shower, coffee, brush your teeth. Does anybody exercise? Do what? Stretch your body. All those things we kind of do automatically. It's not like, you know, and we didn't just, you know, that just didn't come out of the sky. We kind of learned and incorporated those things just by growing up and surviving. Well, think about our kids. They get up and they're disorganized and they haven't had that life experience yet. And what do they do to get organized for their day? Not to mention some kids have a really hard time getting organized first thing in the morning. You know, um, others wake up super early and they crash super early, you know, and vice versa. Everybody has different things, but it's, it's we all seek out sensory stimuli for our nervous systems to work optimally. When it becomes a problem is when you have too much or too little and, and how that affects our nervous system. So for kids, we're really trying to figure out how they interpret sensory information so that they can make the most sense of it. And what do they need to get their bodies organized organized to be um, as functional as possible for that day. Or even in a therapy session, you know, we'll get kids who come straight after school and they're, they've are they been overstimulated all day and they're just ready to, you know, they don't know what end is up. So we have to do a lot of calming techniques to get their nervous system in that just right zone so that they can take advantage of their therapy session. Um, or you might have a child who in the morning is very low arousal and has a hard time getting um, up and ready for school, and there may be some activities that you can do as a parent to help your child get that arousal level up so that uh, they can be more efficient and get on with their, their day. But you know, what's overstimulating to one person could be understimulating to somebody else, so there's no you know, magic formula of, oh yeah, try, do this. Every, you know, this is gonna work, everybody's different. And it can differ in the same person from day to day too. So it can be tricky. So sensory integration therapy targets, you know, the three primary sensory systems, as well as their associated structures in the brain and how that works. And as I mentioned before, these are the three primary uh, sensory systems that affect learning and uh, development uh, the most. So you can see just in the different, uh, you know, categories, that go, there's a lot more than this, but your vestibular system, um, it affects primarily your bilateral coordination, your posture and balance, your muscle tone, your, you know, spatial orientation, speech and language. Um, your tactile system is the most highly related to your behavior. So kids who have a lot of behavioral um, issues or a lot of emotional ability. A lot of times it comes through the tactile uh, system and the, and the temporal and parietal lobes. Um, 
your proprioceptive system has to do with how your muscles are able to coordinate things in a smooth and functional manner. Uh, it's also going to affect your attention span, your body perception, and your motor planning, how you learn uh, new motor skills. So when we do physical and occupational therapy, we want to we want to do this in an environment that is optimal for taking in all these different things. Um, we were talking about this a little bit before we started about the difference between home-based therapy and clinic-based therapy, uh, where it's it's great to get some kinds of therapies at home, especially um, well, especially the last couple of years, <laughs> but uh, with you know developmental things with new babies, there you know could be reasons just to be able to work at home. But you get to a point where you really want to have more sensory input and. A good way of doing that is in an environment that has a lot of different things available uh, to them. So as many different treatment options and tools that you have is ideal for, uh, for working in therapy. Your vestibular system, this just kind of you know, highlights the, you know, what your vestibular system does, but the different areas of the brain that we're activating. So we're working on the inner ear, uh, and your inner ear, the neural connections, that uh, transmit information about where your body is in space are the same ones that we use for speech and language. So speech and language therapy by itself, if you don't incorporate movement with it, you're missing this huge piece or this huge opportunity to really uh, stimulate both speech and motor development. So when you use both of those, you can make, make a big, big difference. Uh, it's also processed in the cerebellum, the brainstem, the visual system, your eyes and your body have to work together, and then your cerebral cortex, how you put it all together. Such so a vestibular. Your proprioceptive system, which is your joints and your muscles, uh, these you know, all come from your, your joints and tendons and, and muscles. And if you're to sit here, and if you just, for, ex for example, just close your eyes for a second. And just feel what you feel through your body with your eyes closed. Can you tell that you're sitting on something without looking at it? Even though you know that you sat there in the first place, but just pretend you, know, you were catapulted or landed on this thing, but you feel those joint receptors through your feet on the ground, through your hips, your knees, all the way up your trunk. You, know, you might be leaning on the table can you feel all those different things? So if you open your eyes again, so you don't miss my wonderful slides, <laughs> uh, that's your proprioceptive system that's giving you that information. So what happens if something's interfering with, with that system, especially in your parietal lobes, or we're not getting information from the parietal lobes about the proprioceptive system and how it's working? It's like your body's floating in space. So how do we organize it to you know, kind of bring it down to earth so you can make sense of that? And then of course your vision is what you know, adds the context, allows you to imagine where you're sitting when your eyes are closed, but also uh, just seeing what your body is able to do. And then the tactile system, uh, looking at your sensory cortex, your brainstem, spinal cord, the thalamus, parietal lobes, all those things um, really affect how you're able to perceive touch, and it has a lot to do with, uh, with your emotional well-being and your behavior. A lot of times kids get, um, especially in school, get in trouble because they're misunderstood, and when we look at, you know, what is it they're getting in trouble for, it could be something as simple as standing in line, and if they, somebody stands too close to them, they have this misperception of touch, so what do they do? They get out of line, or they hit their friend to get them to get out of line, and now they're the one who's in trouble. So, um, you know, we really, you see the behavior, but we have to look underneath what the behavior is and then figure out how to solve it. Without your sensory motor development, all these things are going to be affected. Your communication, your motor skills, you know, how you adapt to change, uh, how you learn, how you relate to others, and you know, really the most important in the end is how you feel about yourself and how you're able to access your full potential. So 
you get the idea how important sensory integration is and why we have to do things that um, are going to target all those different areas together. So now we'll talk about what are those things. It all starts with your head and neck control. And, you know, even back to the example about the handwriting, you know, that might be something that, uh, you know, somebody is frustrated by, you know, with their, their child at school. If their head and neck are not in, you know, in control or their postural control isn't working well, it's going to make it really hard to use your little muscles out here to coordinate writing or to coordinate the eyes and the hands working together. So no matter if you're a month old or 10 years old or 50 years old, it starts with the head and neck control. We've got to develop um, those muscles first. And the way we, uh, our nervous system uh, organizes itself typically is you develop from the head down to the feet and then you develop from the, in the middle of the body out to the extremities. So when you look at typical development of a baby the first year of life, that's what you're going to see. The first thing you've got is the head control, and that's what we're working on. We work on the head control. The first thing I look at is the eyes, what's happening with the eyes and how's the eye, how are the eyes working with the head and neck, you know, because they really go uh, hand in hand. And then we work, you know, down the body. And then the little muscles are the ones that come in last. But to get that head and neck control, we've got to have movement experiences. We have to know where our body's in space. You hold your baby and you rock your baby. That's movement. You know, that helps that baby. Not only does it help to soothe the baby, it helps that nervous system just kind of wake up with that input that it's getting. Uh, in therapy, when you know, we're trying to get the whole body to work together, we work with the body outside of just typical planes of, of development. It's not, you know, if we want a child to walk, we're not just going to stand them up and make them go through the motions of walking. We've got to develop the head down to the feet. We've got to develop the core. And we're going to do that probably with them on their tummy or on their hands and knees or swinging on a platform swing. So we're able to wake up those areas of the brain that are responsible for movement that are going to tell those joint receptors, this is where I am in space. And that's where it starts. Uh, we do a lot of pairing linear motion with function. You know, so again, it's fun and engaging. And you'll see with all these pictures how with children, they are, they are playing and having fun doing therapy. They're, you know, it's, it has to be partially their idea. We set up the, uh, the different things. We know what we want through our uh, therapy goals or what we want to stimulate, but we're going to give the child some control about choosing, okay, which, which activities do you want to do? We know that these are the different uh, things that are going to help, but then the child's more vested. They're playing, they're having fun. And it's really, you start to see the accelerated benefits of that, of that therapy. Uh, here's another way to work on postural strength, you know, on the scooter board or working on a therapy ball. You know, there's so many different, different ways. Um, as we get more involved, we combine more senses together. We combine listening programs. You've got those same neural roots, remember, going through the ears with their motor skills and with their vestibular input. And even kids in a typical classroom, if you had children growing and developing and going to school who weren't out moving and playing on the playground and having free time, which unfortunately many schools are moving in that direction, you're really limiting their potential to grow and learn and develop. They've got to use their bodies, especially when they're little, and use them you know, together in, in a more coordinated way. This is, uh, you know, just, again, motivation, however you can get children motivated to have fun when they're doing different activities, um, they're just more to gain. And you start seeing that, that ball really rolling uh, with kids doing better and better. All of us need sensory choices. You know, we all have, do you have a favorite chair at home that you like to sit in? <laughs> You know, a nice little cozy chair or a good blanket to put over you. Some people like a really heavy blanket or some people like a really light touch blanket. It just 
depends on our, our you know, certain preferences, but all of us thrive from different sensory choices and what uh, we have available to us. We use a lot of deep pressure in a variety of different ways to help with the joints and the muscles because it can be very organizing. So especially these kids who come in from a, a crazy day at school um, or who just have a hard time regulating their sensory input, combining this deep pressure can really help to calm down their nervous system so that they can be um, more receptive to lots of different uh, ways to get in information. We do a lot of bilateral coordination through the upper extremities, not just lower extremities of jumping and hopping and climbing and all that kind of thing, but our upper extremities are just as important. And this is critical before you start to learn how to write, you know, that you have your, your arms where they're able to work together and you have your eyes and your hands so that they can uh, work together. Uh, again, you know, pairing different kinds of activities where this little girl, you can see how she does not have great postural control, and what she's doing is she's kind of locking out her knees, but we have her on an unstable surface, and we use the ball where she has to weight shift to get out of that locked down position. So you're you know, constantly trying to figure out how to, how to get kids to move differently. This is an, a favorite. We have a clinic over at the Shelton School, and uh, this is one of the fun activities that you know a lot of these kids really like. It's getting that deep proprioceptive uh, input in a way where we're combining motor planning of rolling uh, with the deep pressure of being underneath the, the mat and having the pressure of that mat on top of you. We do lots of hanging obstacle courses where we're combining proprioception, tactile, and vestibular input. Um, and the motor planning part of having to go from one piece of equipment to the next and the different textures that that involves. This use, if, if any of us did this, I can guarantee you would be sweating at the end of this obstacle course. <laughs> because just going through these fabric tunnels and everything, you're using every muscle in your body. And you should see these kids when they come out. I mean, they're just like, beaming you know they go through that tire and they crash on the mat and they're laughing and it's like the best thing that ever happened to them but it is hard hard work uh, but it works crawling through little spaces and you can you know you can create things like this at home you know having pillows on the floor and climbing over you know take all the sofa pillows off and they have to climb over and under things and you know we'll come up with a lot of different creative ways for what we call a sensory diet not what you eat, but what you do at home, you know, to help feed the nervous system so that uh, you've got lots of opportunities to continue to, to get that kind of input. This is a rainbow tunnel. It's actually a gymnastic tool, but uh, in the clinic, it's one of the favorites because there's four different layers of this spandex and they actually have to crawl from one layer to the next. And the way you, you start, you might crawl through the middle where you get, um, from one side to the next, but when they get really good, they can go up to the high end and they somersault into the next level. And they just slide down, then they crawl up the other side and they slide down. And, and uh, that's, that's fun and it's also hard for the therapist too because that takes a lot of muscle effort. <laughs> uh, beanbag chairs are great. Again, good, deep, firm pressure, you know, and how do you, how do you get, um, the body organized to be able to do things. Say if you have, you know, you have homework that you have to do or reading words or reciting or even functional vision exercises, you know, having the difference between, um, you know, getting a child's attention if you need them to be in one place, this is a great tool to keep in mind. Can't underestimate the power of hugs and deep pressure and, um, just providing that good, that good feeling. Uh, these are weighted blankets that we use, or there's body socks, uh, again, for different reasons that can help to organize the nervous system. Uh, this is over at Sheldon as well. We used to be involved in an early childhood uh, program there where we would see kids in a group in all the early uh, childhood classes. And just working with them doing different sensory activities and visual motor activities 
in different positions, getting them off, you know, out of sitting in a chair, which, you know, little, little ones really shouldn't be sitting in a chair that much anyway. They need to, you know, develop their muscles in different ways. So any way you can get those muscles to work better, it's a lot easier to move than it is to sit still. So if we're in a classroom and we're wanting them to sit still, it's, it's, you're going to see a lot more motion in a chair than you might in another way of you know, laying there or supporting your body that's better for your, your, body, your uh, muscles and getting that input. Of course, you know, then we have um, just using your muscles, jumping and hopping games are always good. Messy play, you can't underestimate the power of being messy. We see a lot of uh, feeding challenges because a lot of babies, even the first year of life, especially if, um, if a mom doesn't like to get the baby, doesn't like the baby to be dirty, and they'll give them a bite of, of food so the baby has no control over what's going into the mouth, and then they wipe the mouth and then they give another bite and they wipe the mouth so they're getting all this negative oral stimulation. And then we have a picky eater when they're five. And we gotta go back and figure out, okay, what, what happened um, and what do we need to do to kind of undo some of this so that they can take lots of different smells and textures and tastes and have more control over how they process food in their mouth, identify it, and then swallow it. Um, this is always a favorite. Yeah. You don't have to just paint through your hands. You can paint through your little feet too. And I always like to, you know, I just like this, I like pine cones, but <laughs> I like this slide because we have such a reliance on technology these days, and especially after the last couple of years, even, you know, two, three, and four-year-olds are being given iPads to learn how to learn. And there is a time and a place for everything, certainly with our uh, nonverbal kids, having a, an iPad as a communication device is a godsend. I mean, we have therapists who work you know, with um, augmentative communication, but in, in terms of sensory motor development and how you learn and develop, it's a very different experience to hold a pine cone and to feel it, and the stickiness and the prickliness, and the, you know, it's a big thing, but it's really light you learn so much from that experience that you cannot get from looking at it in a picture. So when we're working with kids, while yes, there's the time and the place for you know, the iPads and, and some of that kind of learning, that sensory motor experience really is critical for how they put information together. Uh, here's, this is shaving cream. Um, you could always use whipped cream, I guess, but you know, shaving cream, they drive their little cars through it, they do letters, they do all kinds of stuff, and they just think it's lots of fun. Um, we have organized, more organized tactile input. Uh, this is a therapeutic brushing protocol uh, that was developed by a, a therapist, and not all children, but some children really benefit from this, and it should never be used as, you know, everybody who comes through this clinic gets a brushing protocol. It's not used like that. It's an individual, um, prescribed program that if there's a lot of trouble in processing tactile information and a lot of behavioral responses are a result of that, this can be very organizing to the nervous system and can help to calm it down. Lots of activities, again, crossing over the midline, encouraging that bilateral coordination and that communication between both sides of the brain and all those different lobes talking to each other. When you do, there's a, a program called Brain Gym that you may have heard of. Um, there's different books that you can get on Brain Gym activities. Those are great, you know, for just doing different physical activities that combine both sides of the body. That's what helps to lead to motor planning and getting your body to uh, learn new motor skills. Motor planning is, it's kind of the intuitive know-how of how to do something. For example, a child who does not have motor planning problems, if they saw a tricycle for the first time, they would explore it. 
and they would probably push it and they would eventually get on it and they might even put their feet on the pedal without you having to show them anything. If you have motor playing problems, you look at that tricycle and there's a disconnect. You don't know, well, that could be fun. You know, there's no kind of intuitive know-how that goes with that. And so we show them how to do it and they get on and they cry and they get off. And then you put them back on again and we try again and we put their feet on the pedals and we're really trying to get them to do it. And sooner or later, they'll learn how to ride the tricycle and the motor planning's over. But how do they transfer that skill? So when we work with motor planning, we wanna come up with ways of, of working with the body so that you can transfer those skills to other activities, like tying a shoelace. Nobody has shoelaces anymore, so it makes it even more difficult. But to tie a shoelace, it's a pretty complex motor plan because you've got little muscles, we've got eye-hand coordination, we've got bilateral coordination, and we've got trunk control to have to get down to your foot. But you learn how to tie your shoe eventually. If you have good motor planning, you can apply that's the same technique to tying a bow on a package. But if you don't have motor planning, then you have to learn how to tie that bow on the package just the same way you learned how to tie your shoe. So uh, lots of different variety of tying things. The more opportunities you have to try to tie different things, not just the shoelace or not just the package, but that's gonna help to facilitate that more intuitive know-how of how to explore something. So we wanna do a lot of, um, of that kind of thing. The higher level function, this is um, a program, these are fit lights, they're kind of fun because we can set up different obstacle courses and uh, the lights go off at different times and so the child is waiting for the next light to go off and then running to it and swiping their hand over to turn the light off. Meanwhile, the next light is going on. So it really increases their peripheral awareness, their motor planning, um, and their coordination, and it's, and it's really fun. This is, um, you know, again, when we work with muscle strengthening and handwriting, before we do a lot of work with handwriting, we want to really um, get those little muscles in the hands to work better. This is Jean, one of our uh, Shelton therapists, working with a little girl on just some really little teeny tiny things for those little fingers to come together. And then this is another example of how we work on handwriting, where he's positioned in this, in this um, you know, barrel that can roll a little bit, and this is therapeutic. And we'll bury things in the therapeutic, like little dinosaurs and pennies and you know, little treasures, and they have to use those muscles to dig through that therapeutic to pull out the treasures and see how many treasures they can get. And that really helps with that motor control. Um, always whenever you compare emotions with uh, different activities and functions, um, that is, is helpful for um, kids to make, make sense of the world. Again, think about all those different areas of the brain. You have to have them have something, assign meaning to what it is you're doing uh, for it to be really functional. So we've got lots of different little sensory baskets. Now that we have COVID, everybody has their own personal sensory basket <laughs> on their desk, not a communal basket anymore. Um, we have therapists who work with kids in the classroom just for improving functional activities in the classroom. And this is again where you can get into the difference between um, a clinic-based practice and school-based practice. You know, in our schools, just like, you know, ECI and, um, and school-based therapies, it's, it's provided you know, through our tax dollars, uh, and they have very strict, um, a strict structure for who qualifies for therapy or who doesn't. And for kids who are in the classroom, they may qualify for therapy, and maybe it's for a therapist to see them once or twice a month. I mean, it's not enough to really you know, work on a lot of these things. It's better than nothing, and it's, you know, you, at least you've got an advocate in the classroom who can, who can work with you. But, you know, when you have the opportunity to 
get really good therapy that's working on the whole body and then take that into the classroom and communicate with the teacher on this is what we want to see in the classroom to help support you know, this child's physical function so that they can learn better, then everybody comes out ahead. The teachers like it, the parents like it, the kids like it, the therapists get their follow through that you know, they really like and everybody wins. These are just more little sensory tools. Um, lighting, I always like to kind of mention lighting. Um, fluorescent lighting is often um, associated with seizure activity and even kids who don't have what you might think of as a seizure, they could have silent seizures and it can be related to the lighting, in a, especially in a classroom. A lot of the classrooms have really bright, bright lights that are uh, fluorescent. Um, we use a, a spectrum of light where we don't have that flickering at all um, in our clinic, but even at home, if you can you know, take advantage of your natural light as much as you can and uh, not use fluorescent lighting, that can really help in calming the nervous system uh, and promoting you know, function and rest. And then I also like to mention animal assistance and therapy. We, you know, we always, um, you know, pets and animals really bring a lot to a child's life and they can be very therapeutic on a number of different ways. This um, is actually my, I have my sister and her husband are both teachers, first grade teachers. And this is their uh, Thule, who's their therapy dog. They have Thule and they have Poppy. And the kids read their books to Thule or Pop Poppy, not in front of another person, not in front of the teacher, not in front of the, their, their peers, but they sit in the corner with Thule or Poppy and they read their book and their reading performance of these kids went up dramatically in their classrooms. And they get their little Thule bookmark for each book that they read. And it's a win-win, you know. So if you have, um, if you have a, a dog at home or a, a nice therapy cat, you know, you can have your child try and do some of these, <laughs> these activities for them. And you might be surprised at how it takes that anxiety out of, you know, that performance. I mentioned developmental milestones because you know, we've just had a big um, shift in what they're considering to be developmentally appropriate milestones, but it still is the best measure that we have on what the nervous system is doing and what is the progression of the nervous system and how uh, those skills are actually coming together. But there's a lot that, that you need to consider when you're looking at developmental milestones. And one of them is there are a, big broad category of, of range. So if you think about when a child typically uh, starts to walk, we kind of think of it around a year. But the range is really between nine months and 15 months. Um, now it's even bigger, it's shifted because uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why, there's all kinds of discussion about why our developmental milestones have shifted. but. I think it's working against kids getting early intervention, but um, it gives us a glimpse on if they're on track or not. So if you have a child who's 16 months and they're still not walking, that in itself doesn't have to be um, a big problem, but it could be a red flag, especially when it's coupled with other things. And so we wanna look at what is it that's going on with that child? What, are, what is the pattern for their development? And would they benefit from some early intervention? We do know that the earlier you, um, you work with the nervous system, you can take advantage of the rapid growth that goes on. Look at the difference between when you're born and a year of age. There's so much that changes and, and, you know, with everybody. Um, so you can you know, make that happen faster rather than if you wait till somebody's five years old and it slows down, they're still growing rapidly, but it's not the same speed as that first you know, year to three years of life. Um, all these developmental areas, they're all interrelated. None of them are, are independent on their own. Everybody's different. Everybody develops at their own pace. Uh, even you know, the culture and environment at home plays a part in, uh, in how kids are growing and, and developing. I've seen a, a big problem really in the last couple years, really a 
a lot since COVID, with, um, with babies being overswaddled for too long. Uh, and it's really interfering with their motor development. And because the parents don't know. They're, they're going to the hospital, they're having their babies, they're sent home right away, and nobody thinks to tell them you don't have to be swaddled for six months. You know, so they're coming in, they've got, you know, plagiocephaly, they've got torticollis, they've got all these other motor issues on top of they're just not moving because just because of the swaddling, that's without any other underlying problem with it. So uh, just, you know, what's going on in the culture and environment and education, and I think we can all agree that early intervention really does make a big difference. And I've kind of talked a little bit too long, but why don't you just stretch your arms just for a minute? Just stand up and, <laughs> and stretch. I don't want to put you all asleep. And then I'm going to talk about uh, cranial sacral therapy uh, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, but before I do that, do you have any questions at all about the sensory integration and what it is or why it's important or how it might work? You all agree with me now? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Do I have a list? Um, I, I don't really have a list, but I have on my website, there's a lot of information on it. Um, and also I did write a book um, that has, you know, it talks a, a lot about vestibular and tactile and proprioception and the different activities, different therapies, you know, what we do uh, in that. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, it's, it's more individualized. So, but anyway, so cranial sacral therapy. How many of you have heard of cranial work? Actually, more people have heard of cranial than sensory integration, unless somebody didn't hold their hand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. know what it was well and the reason why actually the reason my the reason I opened my clinic in 1994 was my then six-year-old he's now 35 um, was diagnosed with ADHD and all the doctors had to offer him back then was medication and I had come from California where I had been in a, a hospital-based practice but also a out uh, patient learning development center where we did sensory integration therapy and I knew that sensory integration therapy helped with kids who were diagnosed with attention deficit, um, as well as lots of you know other issues. And so I opened it for him. And I had you know, but I as a parent I couldn't be his therapist, so I had to hire a therapist who worked with him. And because um, it just this, your kids, you get your kids, and your kids get you. You can't be your child's therapist. You're not going to be as effective. So uh, anyway, it's a, it's a great way of working with ADHD. It's a lot easier, like I mentioned before, to, um, to move than it is to sit still. And a lot of kids get misdiagnosed with ADHD because they can't control their body and sit still. Oh. But anyway, cranial sacral therapy is um, it's something, back in 1996, I went to take a class on cranial sacral therapy so that I could tell people why I did not think it would work. Because I couldn't imagine how light touch could make such a big difference in somebody's body. Because remember, I'm a physical therapist. So, you know, in school, we're learning how to do bodies, do what we want them to do. That's kind of traditional training. Well, cranial work is very light touch. It's over the body. It's, you know, physical. You're working with the body. But you're not forcing the body to do anything. And I came away from that class really not knowing what it was, but knowing that it did something for sure. And it kind of started me on this journey of the more I learned, the less I knew. And um, you know, since then, I'm obviously I'm, uh, I'm a diplomat certified cranial sacral therapist, but we have a whole team of five cer certified physical and occupational therapists 
in one clinic, which is almost unheard of. And we get patients from all over the world who come to us just for cranial sacral therapy. It's extremely effective. Um, it's, it's very non-invasive. It's very gentle. And it just kind of helps the entire nervous system work better. And I'm going to just kind of briefly go through that and why uh, that is. The amount of pressure that we put on the body is about the weight of a nickel, which is if you took a nickel out and put it on your finger, that's how much pressure you put over the body. Um, we're working towards, you know, correcting any imbalances in the body based on what we feel, the tension patterns in the, in the fascia. Uh, what your cranial system does is there's fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. Those are constantly, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is constantly being produced and reabsorbed into the body, and you can actually feel the rhythm of that just like you can your heart rate or your breathing rate, you know, having your um, hands on the body. It helps with autonomic flexibility, so your parasympathetic nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system, uh, we help to, to calm that down. So kids and adults who have a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of you know, stress, a lot of GI issues, different things, uh, really respond well to this treatment because it's, so, um, it's so gentle. Uh, this is Dr. Upledger, who he's the, he was an osteopath, um, who really kind of brought the techniques to, initially it was to parents of autistic kids uh, because he saw how children with autism were doing so much better when they could get the, the cranial work, but there weren't enough therapists to do it. So he taught parents how to um, do a lot of these techniques uh, so that they could help their children at home. And uh, because of that, he, grew, he got a lot of slack from the osteopathic community uh, but he didn't care, so he started an a institute where he taught not just parents, but all kinds of other professionals how to do these techniques as well. And uh, now it's a certification process, and um, if you have a license to touch somebody, you can learn it and get certified in it and, and practice it. But um, I'll just kind of highlight this because you can see in developmental delays, neuromuscular delays, challenges, all kinds of things, these are all the sensory systems that are affected by that, your central nervous system, your somatosensory systems, your musculoskeletal system, your lymphatics, your endocrine, respiratory, digestive, cranial, uh, the cranial sacral system influences every one of those things. Um, we use it with all of our concussion patients. Um, it really helps to calm the nervous system after an injury, uh, especially after a brain injury. Uh, so that they can be more responsive to therapies and feel better. We'll have people who come in with splitting headaches after a head injury and leave actually headache free for the first time after one session. It doesn't, you know, depending on what the uh, cause of the issue is, it can, make a, it can make a big difference, often dramatically. The cranial system um, includes the skull bones. And you're, there's a membrane that's attached to all of your skull bones. And then at the base of the skull, it goes through a hole, the foramen magnum, and it goes down your spinal cord where it should move freely up and down your spinal cord. And then it attaches at your tailbone. So we have the cranium and the sacrum. So it's cranial sacral. And then you have down your spinal cord. And out the spinal cord, you have little sleeves of fascia that wrap around the entire body. So no matter where you put your hands on the body, um, you can affect this cranial system. And we'll feel different tension patterns. It's not unusual to, you know, where I might have um, my hands on somebody's chest and it's not moving at, at all. And they'll be having left hip pain or something. And you'll get this to relax and to move and their hip pain goes away because the tension pattern was coming from someplace else. Just like if you have a sheet and you pull a corner of the sheet, you see the, the um, tension pull down that sheet, where at the end of that pull, it's way down there at the foot of the bed, but you've got the restriction up here in your hand. That happens with your body all the time. So any kind of uh, physical or emotional insult into the body has the ability to set up these tension patterns that the body holds on to until it's kind of reminded it can let go of those things. So it can, it can be really um, effective. This is the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the brain, goes down the, um, the spinal cord, 
you know, it helps, it absorbs the shock of that jello in your head. Um, it helps to kind of chelate out all the, you know, any toxins that get into the body. At night is when you really do your big washing of your cerebral spinal fluid when you sleep. So you can see why sleep is so important um, for everything to work better. These are the little um, interdigitations in the skull that move. So when uh, the therapist has their hands on the, the head, you can actually feel the different paired bones of the skull moving in different directions. And so we work with that, again, in this very gentle way, helping to decompress that so that there's no abnormal tension patterns on the central nervous system. These little arrows, these are just kind of highlight the different tension pulls that happen uh, with fascia and, and, the, t and the, um, the tissues in the body. So everything is related, just like your sensory motor development, your physical structure of your body and how it's all put together um, all communicates with each other. So you could be working on one area of the body and you'll feel the release somewhere else. Um, this is just, you know, some highlights of just how gentle it is. We see a lot of babies, a lot of babies for feeding. We do a lot of lactation. It's, um, it's interesting how with babies who have a lip and tongue tie, those tissues are um, embryologically go all the way down to your feet. So a lot of times babies who have a tight lip and tongue tie may end up being toe walkers later. So we look at all those tension patterns. So you can work with, again, not just in the mouth, but we work with the entire spine to help to release that. Uh, a lot of torticollis, pelagiocephaly, uh, brachial plexus injuries, anything that affects the um, musculoskeletal system, again, super gentle to be able to get those things to release. Uh, intestinal problems are very common, uh, constipation, potty training, uh, feeding, um, it all you know, works on that viscera and helps it to relax. With sleep, getting kids to be more regulated in their sleep, also following a concussion. This is a big thing where people have a hard time sleeping often. It helps, it takes off those tension patterns so that they can sleep better. If you can sleep better, you chelate that cerebral spinal fluid better and you kind of wash out all those toxins so you have a healthier nervous system. And you can imagine why that would be good for your body. Uh, speech and language um, as well. You know, again, thinking about those temporal bones, uh, and, and the structures underneath. Did you have a question? It is not a, it's not a manipulation. It was, it was um, the techniques were taught by an osteopath and come from osteopathy, but it's very gentle. It's not, it's not a chiropractic or an osteopathy maneuver at all. It's really just like that weight of that nip, nickel. Um, Kids, they do better in their sessions. When I first started doing it, before I really knew how to even explain it, I had parents who wanted me to come home with them because their kids would sit down at the dinner table for the first time. And you know, they had never seen that before. They'd come home, they'd be calmer, and they'd, you know, they'd feel better. And they'd often have these bright red little ears because they had just released all this tension that was in their head. And as a therapist, it was the most addicting technique I've ever learned. Because with therapy, we're so used to everything taking time, just as you, you know, as parents know how long everything takes to change. And with cranial work, we'll often see change really fast. So it's, it's, it's a great um, tool to have at our disposal. Lots of babies, you know, for a variety of different reasons, babies work, you know, respond really quickly because they haven't had those tension patterns for very long and so it's very easy to release them. We'll see them for maybe one to three sessions often. Here's working with a baby in the mouth, working on the, um, uh, the sucking mechanism. It's very child-centered. You know, people say, well, how do you work with a two-year-old? You know, well, we work with them you know, under the tables and in the pillows and on the swings and wherever they wanna go, we go. We just kind of scoot around behind them and, and uh, get our hands on them. And you kind of get the idea of how gentle it is. Parents, um, especially with the little ones, are often in on the sessions. Uh, 
you know, there's certain ages where it's, they, the child does better if the parent's not in there. It just depends on the child and, and what the issues are. But with the little ones, it, it, uh, it's always kind of nice to, and then parents can see what it is that we're doing too. This is Muhammad, one of our little uh, conjoined twins after he was separated. He's getting sensory integration therapy and cranial work at the same time. So we're able to really combine these therapies um, together and, and do things. This is before they were separated. Uh, working with them, we would do co-treatments. They actually had different cranial rhythms, which was really interesting. Um, they had totally separate central nervous systems and they were off by about a half a cycle each. It was, it was, they were really fun to work with. Uh, this is Ahmed, same thing. He's getting sensory integration therapy and cranial at the same time. This is actually my son, who's now 31. <laughs> and he still does this when he gets cranial. He goes right to sleep. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's kind of wraps it up. Everybody is different. You know, the more options you have for therapy, the better. I hope this gave you an idea of some different therapies that you might not have known very much about. Uh, before some of the ones on the on the left that are listed up here, these are all the different things that we do. Uh, so you can see, there's no you know nobody comes in and gets a cookie cutter approach. It's different for everybody, and um, we just we love what we do. This is a, a resource for you. You can find it uh, at a website whenkidsfly.com. Um, they also sell it at Barnes & Noble and on Amazon, if you can find a bookstore that's open. <laughs> and, uh, but you can get it online. And that's it. I did it just on time. Oh, my gosh. I thought it was going to be early. But uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for saying that. It really, I mean, there are so many different ways to work with kids. There's, there's no, uh, just the more, t the more tools you have, the better. Everybody's different, so it's nice to have all those things to work together. <laughs> yes. The best place to start is, is with a good sensory motor developmental evaluation, and it depends on the age, too. So we want to get a good idea of what the baseline is, what are the issues, what sensory systems are affected. With ACC, you really have to, the more you, you put into the nervous system, the better. So a really, the, the main focus is going to be that sensory integration therapy, and then all the, everything that goes around that. There's so many other you know, the developmental piece gets pulled into that. Um, uh, you can have speech and feeding pulled into that. We can have gross motor and fine motor, all that pulled in through that sensory integration piece. Uh, it's a hierarchy of goals, depending on where it is that you're starting. So nobody, you know, when we do an eval, again, depending on the age, uh, the younger ones, they may come in for an hour developmental eval. Whereas an older child will do more sensory motor uh, evaluation, like four and up, we'll do all the sensory motor testing and gross and fine motor skills and that kind of thing. It's about two hours. No matter what, we like having a parent conference afterwards where we'll talk to the parents for an hour. We schedule an hour to go through everything and really uh, you know, talk about functionally what's going on, what are the goals, what are the needs, what, where do we start, um, a, a lot of times I'll have kids start with the sensory motor work and just get used to coming to the gym and all the different stuff and then we'll pull in craniosacral therapy um, or then we'll pull in speech and feeding or we'll pull in OT or uh, PT. Usually OT and PT work together on the um, sensory motor piece where they might do PT one day and OT another day. 
um, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, we have to start, we start wherever the child is, and then and you go from there. But we really, education and parent communication is really important. I mean, we, it's not um, like you're in a vacuum and don't know what's, what's going on. We really, even though the parent's not in there for those sessions, uh, necessarily just because there's too many people in the big gym, if we're doing sensory integration work, um, we're communicating either, you know, via email or phone or whatever you set up with your therapist on what's going on. Well, one of the things, and part of the evaluation is you'll complete a complete developmental profile um, and a history, medical history, everything, so that we have all that information. The therapist will call you, talk to you ahead of time. Um, you know, what are your concerns? What's going on? What have you been doing? You know, we, you know, part of the reason we we have so much available is because kids don't just need PT or just need OT or just need speech. They need they need a lot of things a lot of times. And the more involved, the more services you do need. And it's a way of getting all those in one place so that you don't have to drive 10 different places to get it. Um, and again, just you know, starting with wherever your child is. Um, and that's, that's really the value of that parent conference. And, and the therapist has their um, expertise to share with you what they have seen and how this might help them. And then you, as a parent, can decide, is this, you know, something that I want to pursue or try or, or whatever. So anyway, thank you for your attention. I'll, you have your finger, has any other questions?